Well, good morning. It's great to see you this morning. I want to welcome everyone that's worshiping with us online. We're excited to be together this morning as we continue in our series, What Makes Us? The beginning of this year, we've been spending the first weeks looking at our core values, at what makes us, us. Let's take a look at our church here from our vision, our mission, and our core values. And we have our vision, follow Jesus together. Maybe you've heard us say that a time or two. We have our mission and we have our core values. The first week of this series, we looked at biblical authority. Last week, we looked at our core value of prayer and what it means to, to commune with God. We're going to continue in that theme this morning of being with God as we look at our third core value, community engagement. I remember when I was younger and I was getting my driver's license. Do you remember as you were learning to drive, all the different hours you had to get behind the wheel, and then you had to take the written exam and everything you had to memorize for this exam? Well, if you were like me and you had, you know, two people helping you learn how to drive, maybe you had two different personalities. You know, my mom and dad both helped me learn how to drive, and my, my mom was the, let's just say she was the more patient and calmer one. And my dad, well, he was a little bit more intense. One afternoon, I was driving with my mom through town, and, well, you know, it's about lunchtime, and my mom said, hey, let's, let's pull into this Wendy's and get some lunch and get it to go. And so I, I drove up to the drive through where you could, you know, roll the window down and say to the speaker what you wanted. You know, at that age, I felt like I was a king. You know, I was speaking through a window to someone that wasn't even there, just a speaker. So we ordered the food and we're taking the turn around the building and my mom had a white minivan. And you know those yellow concrete beams? Yeah, I know those too. (laughs) And uh, I took the turn just a little too tight and it scraped the side of my mom's white minivan. And my mom was still a little bit patient and calmer in the moment, but I knew as soon as I get home, my dad would see this, it would be game over. So I called a couple of my buddies and said, hey, meet me at the house and, and we'll take some of this rubbing compound and we'll try to get this off the van. And wouldn't you know it, as we were in the middle of doing that, my dad pulls into the driveway. Maybe you have a story like that. Maybe you have something where you were learning how to drive and something happened. Maybe you hit something like I did or, or maybe something else happened or maybe you have someone at home right now who is a young driver learning how to drive and, and maybe you can relate to that. But here's what I remember. You remember taking the the written exam and all the different road signs you had to memorize. Now those have become second nature to us. Now we see them on the road and it just automatically clicks in our mind what this sign means. I'm going to show a few signs here this morning. If you're a young driver, hopefully this is helpful for you. Uh, If you're an experienced driver, we should be able to get this. All right, you ready? Let's look at our first road sign. This is a no-brainer. All you got to know is your left from your right. As you're going down the road, you see this sign, and it tells us, hey, whatever direction we might be going right now, eventually there is a left turn ahead. That's a pretty simple sign. Now, let's take a look at this next sign. This sign is the devil, you know. <laughs> this is all over the suburbs of Columbus, right? I hate roundabouts. Maybe you are like me. You never know when someone's going to turn off or when you're going to pull out. And, uh, I mean, they, they have them all over the place trying to help with the flow of traffic. We got one right up here at St. Kitts and Lozelle. I hate these things. I drive through one every single day. Now, this next time I'm going to show you, if you're like me and you grew up outside of the city of Columbus, maybe this sign here, you know, this is God's country. You see this, you know you are breathing in fresh air. All right? This is God's country. You know you're driving down a road, and you got some woods on your left and on your right, and you got to be alert because there might be a deer. There might be a deer pop out. If you are a young driver and you drive only in the city of Columbus, I encourage you to venture out to a place where you can see this sign. All right? Let me show one more for us. This sign here, it symbolizes a merger, that there's the flow of traffic, And then that there is one lane on the right that's going to merge in with the other. That these two lanes now become one movement. Well, in essence, when I see this sign, it reminds me of what it means to follow Jesus. 
See, before we give our lives over to Jesus, we could be living in our own lane. We could be doing the things that we want to do, have our own thoughts, our own desires, moving at our own pace, going in our own direction. And then when we give our lives over to Jesus, fully over to him, we say, Jesus, it's not about me. It's not about the direction I'm going. It's not about how fast or how slow I want to go. But now I am merging. I'm living my life with you. We give our lives over to Jesus. We begin to live with him and to be with him. And it's no longer about us. But Jesus, now now we are with you. Now we live life with you. Paul tells us, In the book of Colossians, what it means to live life with Jesus. He says this in Colossians 3. He says, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. We look and we live with an eternal perspective, not in the temporary. Verse 3 says, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear. What's it say? With him in glory. When we follow Jesus, we are living life with him. Paul continues in that passage of chapter 3 of Colossians, giving us visible examples of what it means to say, okay, my heart mimics the desires of your heart, Jesus. My mind is on the same page as yours, Jesus. We begin to live life with him. It's not about us. Jesus, we're living with you. Now, how did, how, as Paul said, how did Jesus' heart, how did his mind affect the way he interacted with his community? Maybe a simpler question. How did the de- desires of his heart fuel the way He engaged in the communities that he lived in. I can tell you this, it was central to the way that he lived and how he interacted. His heart fueled the way he interacted in the environments in which he lived. He could walk and see a paralytic man on the ground. And Jesus, bending down to look him in the eye, says, take heart, my son calling him a very intimate name, my son. He says, your sins are forgiven, knowing full well that this paralytic man's eternal destination was more important than his difficult circumstance, but still filled with compassion. Jesus could tell him, now get up and walk. Jesus could see someone with leprosy who had the quarantine, And believe me, they would have loved to have quarantined in a basement for 14 days. But instead, they were outcast outside the city walls where people didn't have to see them. People didn't have to smell them. People didn't have to to come within a six feet of social distance around them. They were to live outside of everybody else. But the heart of Jesus could go up to this person with leprosy and touch them. Defeating all cultural norms and say, you are healed. Jesus' heart was for people that needed hope, that needed forgiveness, that needed a second chance. One day Jesus was walking through this town, and the Bible tells us that there were crowds that were following him. A lot of people were there. A lot of people wanted to see Jesus. They were, they were mobs around him. They were lining the streets. And as he's walking down the street, he sees this guy up in a tree, a guy in the town that people hated. They thought he was a liar. They thought he was a cheat. And with everybody there to witness and to hear what he was about to say, Jesus looks up and says, Zacchaeus. Come on down, man. I'm going to come over to your house for lunch today. And everybody started to say, what is this guy doing? But his heart was central to the way that he engaged in his community. And Paul tells us this. 
that when we get out of our own lane, whenever we say, Jesus, we are with you, we're living life with you, that our hearts need to mimic the desires of Jesus' heart. So church, how do we engage our community? I can tell you the answer is pretty simple. Community engagement happens when we simply live life with Jesus. When we live life with him. And we say, okay, Jesus, my life isn't solely about me. But now I want to live with you. It'll happen. Because we will begin to see the circle of influence of people that are living life with us a little bit differently. We'll be able to see and recognize people who are yet to know Jesus and engage with them in a way that Jesus did. Mark Moore, an author of of many books, and he is a teaching pastor out in uh, Arizona, He helped us with our post-baptism curriculum. When someone's baptized here, they get a four-week session of curriculum that helps them walk and follow Jesus right after their decision. He wrote this in a book titled Core 52. I highly recommend the book. He wrote this. He said, walk with people as you walk with Jesus. Before long, they'll meet each other. That's community engagement. Walk with people. Live life with the people that that you are in your circle of influence and walk with Jesus. Live life with him. The same desires of his heart. And guess what? They'll eventually meet. One day they will meet each other. Now, a key component that we can't miss here is who actually did Jesus interact with? Who did he live life with? There's an old Christian phrase that's been around the church for a number of years, and the phrase goes like this. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. And that phrase is absolutely true. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. We we think eternally. We think with our eternal mindset, not in a temporary circumstance. And we don't conform to the patterns of the world. That's absolutely true. But perhaps sometimes... We put an emphasis on not being of the world that we forget to live in it. And guess what? Jesus lived in it. He was in it. And Jesus, in one of his last prayers that he prayed, he prayed that we would be in it too. In John 17, Jesus prays this prayer. He says, my prayer My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world. There's the phrase, we're not of it. This is our temporary home. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Well, what is truth? We learned about that the first week of this, what makes us serious. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, think about this. As Jesus is sent into the world, Jesus says, I have sent them into the world. Just as God sent Jesus into the world to bring about a message of salvation, Jesus is sending us into the world to make him known. And if community engagement happens, When I live life with Jesus, then I need to live life with Jesus. Jesus' life, his mission, wasn't solely to be around believers, but he brought a message of good news for those who were yet to know him. And Jesus says, as you've sent me into this world, Father, now I have sent them into the world to bring about that same message of good news. It's intentional. Being sent by Jesus is missional. That's what he has prayed for us. To be into the world, to bring about the message that Jesus himself was sent into the world to bring. It's part of living life with Jesus. 
Now this morning I have a great example of what it means to live life with Jesus. There was a student in our college ministry. His name is Alex. He had an encounter with a friend that he was living with in this quad down at Ohio State University. The cool thing about Alex's story is that he was invited to this church and invited to be a part of the college ministry by a a, a member as a friend of this church. They both go to Ohio State. Alex had this encounter with a roommate who was yet to know Jesus. We were able to sit down with Alex and hear his story and able to get it on video. So would you please watch this video with me? My name is Alex Myers. I'm a student at Ohio State. I study mechanical engineering. I'm in my third year. Um, in my free time, I like to watch Buckeye football, and I've played the cello since third grade. I was church hopping in the area, trying to find a good church uh, when I came to Ohio State. Uh, I was recommended to look at this church originally by the pastor at my home church, and, uh, and I was plugged into the college class by Chris Egolf. My sophomore year, uh, I was placed in a suite style dorm, so one of the suite mates that uh, we were at random paired up with was a guy by the name of name of Andrew, and he was a, an international student from Serbia. As it seemed by pure chance, we ended up in the same room together, but at this point, I don't think it was chance. Um, I think God had a part to play in that. The first really long conversation that I had with Andrew was, I started out from just noticed he got a new haircut. So we were just talking about his new haircut um, because he had long hair and then he like got the trim on the sides with long on top. So we were talking about his haircut. He believed in some sort of higher power. Um, and so we were just kind of talking about like the nature of that higher power. And then I, I ended, I got to eventually bring that around to the gospel. I remember the first time we really like actually opened a Bible, uh, the both of us was like talking about how uh, the passage where Jesus tells his disciples to ask and seek and knock. Um, That was like the first passage that we read together. So like I said, like, you know, if you're seeking after God, then he's going to seek you back as well. Unfortunately, due to some family strife that was going on at that point in time, his parents decided that he needs to transfer schools because frankly, Ohio State's expensive for an international student. So he ended up transferring to a community college in Berkeley, California. So uh, we left on a good standing, but uh, he wasn't uh, a believer at that point in time. I remember praying for him pretty uh, regularly um, because like, I wanted him to continue asking questions and to continue to be curious. This past November, Andrew reached back out to me and we caught up over a Zoom meeting. He informed me of his decision to follow Jesus and I was super excited and we talked about how he saw the way that his friends were living out in Berkeley was not in accordance with with the way that God wants us to live. And like he came to the conviction that he needed it to change his life. I asked him like, hey, uh, how can we get you plugged into a church? You need a community of believers around you and how can we get you baptized? And so we formulated a plan and he ended up flying over all the way from Berkeley to Columbus. And I got to baptize him here at Worthington. Yeah, it was my, my first time baptizing someone into Christ. So uh, it was a, a great experience for me as well. And I got to uh, really see um, a, what was a year and a half long pro Because I, I didn't even know, like, in, in originally like having these conversations, I mean, I don't know what this guy's gonna do after. And it's, and like when he left, it was kind of got to the point, it was like, uh, it was, all our conversations in vain, like, is he just gonna drop all this? And But I knew at the, at the same time I'd planted the seed and it's not up to me to try and get someone else to come to Christ. Like the Holy Spirit has to work in their own life. And so I'm just here as an ambassador to Christ. The thing that gave me the most comfort was that God wanted to reach him as much as I wanted to reach him. I think the biggest thing is people kind of can get caught up in like, do I just need to immediately share the entire gospel account with someone in one sitting. And really, it, this, these conversations came in chunks throughout like a, an entire three or four month period. So uh, as I said, at the very beginning, we started talking about his haircut. Uh, it, did, it didn't have anything to do with religion or anything like that. So I think uh, people can get caught up in uh, just like, oh, what do I say? But really, like if you just allow 
um, that type, those types of topics come up and you don't resist that, I mean, it can be very natural. And that's what I found out through this. Church, that's what it means to engage community. College student. Befriended somebody by simply saying, nice haircut. And it led to them being in this baptistry. Baptizing someone into an eternal relationship with Jesus. We are reminded, community engagement happens when we live life with Jesus. Pure and simple. We just live life with him. Alex planted a seed, built a relational bridge that took over a year and a half. Now, I love Alex. I love the way he follows Jesus. But was there anything special? Was there a special formula that he followed? Were there certain words that he said? If I say these exact words, and then, then this person will give their life over to Jesus. No. No. But he was intentional. And that's part of living life with Jesus, is living a life of intentionality. Because Jesus lived a life of intentionality. Sparking up that initial conversation, built a relational bridge where this guy flew away. He lived in California. And then when he came, he said, okay, this person planted the seed of Jesus in my heart. I'm ready to give my life over to him. So guess what? Over Christmas break, he flew from California one day got baptized by Alex here at the church the next day, and then flew back to California the day after that. All because someone lived a life of intentionality. As we, as we begin to look at the life of Jesus, Jesus was intentional with two very important things. One, Jesus was intentional with his eyes. Jesus was intentional with his eyes, the way that he saw people. Sometimes we see people and identify them and label them by our relational context. They're our neighbor. They're a family member. They're a friend. They're someone we hang out with at the pool. They're someone we see at our kids' school. Jesus didn't do that. He was intentional in the way that he looked at people and he saw them. It tells us this in Matthew 9 about how Jesus saw the crowds. He said, when he saw, when he looked at them with his eyes, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He saw into their heart. There's people all around us, all around our circle of influence who are yet to know Jesus. Who are yet to know him. And we can be intentional. Knowing, okay, this person's not just my friend, they're not just a neighbor, but they are someone that has an eternal soul. And when we look at people intentionally, it leads us to share a message intentionally. Jesus was intentional with his message, he was intentional with the words that he spoke. Hey, I like your haircut then he was intentional with the way that he shared the gospel. Let's think about this for a second. In the world that we live in today, in the world that is more divisive probably than a very long, long, long time, in a world that seems like every day is full of some type of bad news, full of doom and gloom, we have a message of hope. We have a message that can literally change the world. And we can't share this message by just sharing our opinions on current events. But we can share this message by sharing Jesus. Jesus lived a life where he shared a message of hope, of kindness. And he was compassionate. 
Paul tells us this about our special message. He says this in Ephesians 4. He says, be kind. Everybody say, be kind. Be kind. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example. I'm not in my own lane doing my own thing, but I've given my life over to Jesus, and so now I'm living with him, which means I have a message that can change the world. Community engagement isn't complicated. It's not difficult. It's just living life with Jesus. When we live life with Jesus, Jesus, we're living life with you. Our hearts are your, same as your hearts. Our thoughts are the same as your thoughts. We're living life with you. It's not about me. And we live life with other people. Guess what? They'll eventually meet. And that's what we were sent to the world to do. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus. We thank you for the way that he intentionally engaged with us. Help us, Father, to have the heart that he has, the mind, the ability to to see people differently and to share a message, Father, that brings about good news. Help us, Father, to do what you've asked us to do. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen.